Hi. You talked a lot about the upper extremity and the neck. Is there much data on lower extremities, particularly knees? I find that I tend to stand with my, my knees locked a lot of the time. Is there much data on the damage of that over time? Um, that's not something that we've studied in our group, but certainly in the survey-based studies, there has been a higher report of you know, lower leg pain. Um, and so I think it depends a large degree to the kinds of works that you do. So especially if you are you know, doing ERCP, wearing heavy lead aprons, um, and on increasing your loads overall, that may increase your risk of the lower extremity uh, disorders as well, but not something that I've systematically studied. So it, it seems intuitive that if you have an injury and you have some inflammation that you want to take an anti-inflammatory, but I've read also that the inflammatory response to an injury uh, is helpful in some ways necessary to heal uh, that particular uh, insult or injury, uh, and that re that also has created a recommendation that anti-inflammatory should not be used acutely um, in an injury in which there is inflammation. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, um, I had gone to a talk on tendinosis by one of the sports medicine physicians uh, at UCSF, and the literature on NSAIDs is really mixed. Um, there is not a strong body of literature to support it. Uh, the benefit may just come from the analgesic effect, not so much from the anti-inflammatory effect. So certainly this is something, again, to, to think about and discuss in conjunction with your physicians, because um, some of the particular types of injuries may benefit more from something like a steroid injection. But have there been any studies that actually show that anti-inflammatories are helpful in this situation? Um, other, I can't say other, I've engaged other, that literature. Yeah, other than just relieving pain. I haven't engaged the literature enough to be able to answer that question. How does the knee device exposed procedure, especially in your wrists? I think that we think of ice uh, anytime there is an acute injury, but if you're routinely needing ice after a procedure, the question is, what are you doing the in the procedure that's causing that pain, and what can you do to try and even minimize that pain from happening in the first place? I'm, what I really hope for us to understand is that we really need to respect pain, because that's that first sign that there is some kind of injury going on. Um, you talked about this in a very uh, comp sort of a general way, which seems to imply, you know, that passing the scope is responsible for a lot of this. But um, is there any work on exactly what interventions are the, are the most painful or, or stressful? I, I've always wondered, for example, if the interventionalists have more trouble than other gastroenterologists or um, whether passing the scope itself is a problem or depending on whether you're doing something for uh, polyp removal or treating varices, whatever, that it's part, it's another part of the procedure specifically that makes things really difficult. Uh, so I think that the general answer is that the scope is so poorly designed that any interaction that we have with the scope um, because of non-neutral postures, the high forces that are required to manipulate the scope, um, and the loads that it's putting on the muscles is associated with um, potential risk for injury. In terms of specific things during endoscopy. Uh, in our study, we specifically looked at uh, just colonoscopy, but insertion seems to be associated with higher um, forces than withdrawal, but we spend more time in withdrawal, and even the withdrawal forces are quite high. So it's just, in general, our exposures during endoscopy are quite high. Whether or not the interventionals are at, are at increased risk, they have additional risk factors, again, often because they're wearing the lead aprons, which can put additional strain on the neck and back. Um, and I've had advanced endoscopists talk to me and say that they actually find colonoscopy to be the hardest thing that they do, uh, especially colonoscopy and advanced EMRs, because of often the strain that's required for these longer procedures to remove sometimes these complicated polyps. So I think it's the time for exposures, uh, so the time of procedures, but also just the endoscope is a poorly designed instrument, and I think that just the mere fact that we're interacting with it so repetitively throughout a day, uh, we're exposing ourselves to risk. Amandeep, uh, that was a great talk. Um, I guess you've talked a bit about the endoscope companies, and I, and I just wonder where they are right now as far as their receptiveness, or are there prototypes that people are trying to design, and what would a perfectly designed, ergonomically designed endoscope look like? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think the endoscope companies actually are interested in, in answering that. Um, so to some degree, uh, our biggest uh, problem is ourselves as endoscopists. So the endoscope companies may have come up with alternate designs, but when they introduce it to endoscopists, you know, we have a muscle memory that's built in from having scoped. So when we have a new scope design that we're holding, it feels different, it feels weird. We're very conscious of our incompetence with the new scope design, and so we give them negative feedback, and that kills the design at the outset. And so we, first off, have to be open to considering new designs. There's definitely going to be a learning curve. Uh, the optimal endoscope will, to some degree, take advantage of the muscle memory that we've already built, yet neutralized postures, minimize forces and uh, be designed such that even like the smallest, weakest female could use it without running into problems. And then just one other question. You mentioned that many of our institutions, including our own, we have ergonomic people that come in and I guess I know very little about actually what that means to be an ergonomic expert and does it sound like, uh, I don't think we've ever brought our ergonomic folks into the endoscopy suite, but are they, is part of their training that they can walk into any work situation and identify ergonomic problems? Yeah, so um, many of the principles that we talked about, there's lots of risk assessment tools. So an ergonomist is someone who would have gotten advanced training and often will have a license in ergonomics. And they will use one of these advanced tools. Um, mostly what they're looking for is what kind of postures are you working in because abnormal postures are going to be a problem. So they can immediately come in and see if the monitors don't look like they're adjustable enough, um, or if there's other things in the endoscopy suite that they, that they can do to try and um, neutralize postures. That's a huge thing. And then oftentimes when they come in, they're amazed to see how poorly designed the endoscope is, and they're not going to be able to help with that. But when we've had ergonomic uh, specialists come into our unit, they've brought in or shown us different stools, for instance, like if we wanted to do a potentially a sit versus stand colonoscopy. Um, some people do find benefit from sitting that hasn't been systematically studied in the one AGA survey that was published a few years ago or presented at DDW uh, two years ago. Um, when you were sitting, the physicians who sat did report increased neck problems, again, probably related to the monitor height. Um, but there can be some benefits to alter alternating postures, and so they can help um, sort of think, help think outside of the box and give you some ideas, especially if you're having problems. They're mainly trained, you know, most of the time hospitals are using them for computer workstation design, but those same skills apply to workstation design even for endoscopy. Awesome. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you.